Good evening. I am Ann Shea, president of the Illinois Patrons of the Arts in the Vatican Museums. I'm so happy to be with you this evening. As patrons and friends of patrons, whenever we gather, we do so in the service of our mission. The Illinois Patrons of the Arts in the Vatican Museums is a nonprofit organization that raises funds for the, for the preservation, care, exhibition, and restoration of art in the Vatican Museums. One of the ways we pursue this mission is through educating ourselves on how art can be appreciated from an artistic and faith perspective and how both these perspectives can come together to enrich and support our lives. And in fact, this is what we've been doing for the last year and a half in our initiative, Rosa Mystica, A Journey of Renewal and Restoration. Of course, Rosa Mystica is a title for Mary, Mystical Rose. We thought the richness of our artistic Mary and our tradition could be brought forward as a support and inspiration for our lives of faith, especially in these difficult times when we are engaging in the struggles of the pandemic. And this has proven to be the case. The grateful and diverse responses we have received tell us the programs touch many people and allowed their faith to accompany them in a very real way on their journey. Perhaps this, above all else, shows the importance of our mission and the invitation to support it. We started Rosa Mystica, a journey of renewal and restoration in the Zoom world in October of 2020 with Mary, Art is a Carrier Faith, and continued throughout the year with Mary, Hear of the Word, Mary, the Sorrowful Mother, and Mary, the Mother of All Nations. Tonight is our final webinar, Mary, Sign of Glory. In this program, we bring together three pieces of the Marian artistic tradition that coincide with the mission of the patrons and express and communicate faith convictions and values. The first piece is germane to the Illinois patrons. It is a part of Chicago lore about the great Chicago fire of 150 years ago that we commemorate this year. It is a unique form of our mission to preserve Marian art. Father Larry McBrady will tell us about it. It was a Sunday evening, October 8th, 1871. It had been a period of time where there had been very, very little rain through the months of September and early October. So on this particular Sunday evening, when a fire started over on DeCoven Street at about 8.30 or 9 p.m., it didn't seem all that unusual because there had been a lot of fires. In fact, the fire department was pretty exhausted. The fire began in the in or around the O'Leary barn. Now, you, of course, have heard stories about that. But the fact is, the origin of the fire is unknown, even after 150 years. De Coven Street, by the way, is located south of Taylor and east of the Dan Ryan. And on that exact spot where the fire began now stands the Chicago Fire Academy. So once the fire began, it started to spread rapidly due to the very high winds on that particular Sunday evening. And the fire began to move north and east, as you know, destroying the very center of the city. Now, while all this was happening, up on the north side, in the 1400 block of North North Park Avenue. If you're not familiar with North Park Avenue, it's Franklin Street with a different name. Up there, at some point, the Cincinnati Dominican Sisters, who had been teaching for three years since the school opened at Immaculate Conception Parish, became aware through the tremendous glow of fire that was lighting up the sky that the fire was definitely coming their way. We don't know when it happened, but at some point it was determined by the sisters that at least a few of the valuables had to be saved. And for the sisters, one of the valuables was their piano, which they used for giving piano lessons and in that way, making some money for the sisters. So as incredible as it may seem, they were able to bury the entire piano in the ground and then their thoughts turned to the painting of the Immaculate Conception, which you see on your screen. That has always been a real treasure for the parish. 
And we are so grateful. We at Immaculate Conception Parish are so grateful to the sisters who were able to bury that also. And how they did it, we don't really know, but they did an excellent job because all these years later, we still have it. It's a real treasure in our church. I've been told that they had to wait for a period of days before they would be able to dig it up because the ground was still so hot from this terrible fire that completely destroyed the church and the school and the entire neighborhood. But they had marked the spot and they knew where to go. And so to this day, that this very beautiful painting hangs in our church. And we are grateful to these unknown sisters who did so much for us. One final thought. We have no idea what the priests were doing during that time. Thank you. Thank you, Father McBrady. The second piece shows us the art of restoration and faith communication. It begins with an unlikely find, and some of you may already know this story. Several years back, I was walking through the villa in Mundelein Seminary and saw an open closet door and noticed the back of a painting. I turned it around and saw a Marian painting of the Annunciation. It was damaged in need of serious help. That memory has stayed with me. I presented the situation to our board, and they thought it was an opportunity to act in our commitment to restore art, and now in real time. So we brought in the Conservation Center of Chicago. They restore the painting. You'll see the video. Then Cardinal Supich and Father Camelli will discuss this restored painting, and Father Camelli will theologically reflect on it. The Conservation Center is honored to assist the patrons of the arts with this important conservation project. The following video features our conservators conducting treatment on the Annunciation. This is Josh McCauley, Senior Conservator of Frames and Gilding at the Conservation Center. In the previous video, the overpaint and oil gilding was removed, leaving the original water gilding intact. The structural conditions of the wood substrate were stabilized and filled as needed. The previous fills were removed and the gesso layer was consolidated. Once the gesso layer was stable, losses were filled using a traditional rabbit skin glue gesso. The fills are refined to emulate the surrounding areas and a layer of yellow bowl was applied to the entire surface. In the final phase of treatment, several layers of red bowl were applied to select areas of the frame. The areas chosen will be water gilded and then burnished to a mirror-like finish. The selected areas of water gilding will highlight aspects of the frame and create variation within the gilded surface. Prior to gilding, the bowl had to be further refined by using ultra-fine, oil-free steel wool to create an even and smooth surface for the gold leaf. The next step is to water gild the areas selected with red bowl. Water gilding is achieved by applying a solution of water, alcohol, and glue, such as gelatin or rabbit skin glue, to the surface of the bowl, then immediately applying the gold leaf. The solution activates the glue used in the bowl, which is how the gold leaf is adhered to the surface in this technique. Once the water gilded areas have had some time to dry, the next step is to burnish the surface. The burnishing tool is made from a shaped and polished piece of agate. The tool is gently applied to the gilded surface, which compresses the clay used in the bowl, leaving a mirror-like finish. After all the areas of water gilding are complete, the next step is to oil gild the remaining surface. Oil gilding is achieved by applying a prepared size to the surface, allowing the size to set up and become slightly tacky. The gold leaf is then applied to the size, then gently tamped down with a soft brush. Oil gilding has a slightly matte appearance, creating contrast with the burnished water gilding. 
The frame is now fully gilded and if necessary can be lightly abraded and toned to give a more aged appearance. Hello, my name is Amber Shabdak and I am the Senior Painting Conservator at the Conservation Center. Up until this point, we have finished all the cleaning and structural issues with the Annunciation. This final phase is purely cosmetic and is called impainting or retouching, which means only painting on areas of loss or damage to minimize the distraction and allow the viewer to read the painting as it was intended by the artist. We use paints specifically made for conservation when impainting. These paints are soluble in solvents that will not affect the original paint if they are removed in the future. Our paints will age differently than the original paint layer, and at some point, the impainting will become mismatched and need to be redone. But thankfully, this will not happen for quite some time, and hopefully not in my lifetime. The paints used on the Annunciation are made by Golden and are called MSA paints. They are mineral spirit-based acrylics and will remain soluble in mineral spirits after drying. We also use shell gold to impaint the areas of loss in the gold passages. This is a pure ground gold that is in gum arabic binder like watercolors. All of our impainting will then be sealed with a final layer of a synthetic varnish that will saturate the impainting and also protect the original paint layer. Our work will be able to be detected under UV light as dark areas of non-fluorescence. The Annunciation has been undergoing treatment for many months now and we look forward to the finished results. We hope you've enjoyed these videos as much as we have enjoyed treating such a magnificent painting. Cardinal Supic, it's good to be with you. We've been asked to uh, talk a little bit about the theology and spirituality of the Annunciation prompted by this uh, beautiful painting, um, which has just been recently restored uh, under the patronage of the, uh, the Vatican patrons of the arts in the uh, Vatican museums. And uh, this painting is attributed to the school of Ghirlandaio. Uh, end of the 13th century, beginning of the 14th, and uh, just extraordinary, beautiful painting. But in any case, uh, as you look at it, there, there are various features that are classic in the representation of the Annunciation. Uh, let me just offer a, a comment, and then perhaps you can pick up on your own uh, sense of, of the, the mystery that's depicted here of the Annunciation. You know that Mary here is in a stance of inwardness and obviously the angel coming, bearing the message and she taking that message within her says, yes, fiat, let it be done to me according to your word. So there is this intense interior moment, but at the same time, which is just extraordinary, is that this could not be more of a public act because she is speaking in the name of all humanity accepting the Savior into the world. So this kind of uh, paradox of interiority and uh, public, um, uh, a, a public affirmation uh, and consent, cooperation with the grace of God so I don't know how you see this here, but for me, that particular dimension of the Annunciation has always been very important. Yes, and I would agree with that, especially in terms of also the moment in which the divine and the human come together. Yes, yes. Because here you have the angel. Uh, I've always heard that angel's feet are never shown because mm -hmm. uh, they move so very swiftly at God's <laughs> command. But then also there is this humility of Mary, yeah. the way she has her hand, but look at her eyes. Yeah. They really are cast down, attentive, uh, wanting to in some way to know how she should respond. And yet at the same time, not in pride filled, no. but there is a, there's no. a sense of great humility, uh, which in fact is the posture that every human being should have before the word of God that comes into our lives. So in many ways, this is, always, this is also an opportunity for us to reflect on our approach to listening to the Word of God at Mass. Yeah. For here, she hears the Word of God that became flesh in her. In many ways, that also has to be 
our approach to when we, when we come to the Eucharist and hearing God's word. Yes, uh, indeed. And you know, I, I'm sure you remember our common teacher of <laughs> Mariology in Rome at the Gregorian University, Father, uh, the great uh, Jesuit Mariologist, uh, Candido Pozo. Yes. And uh, he underscored, I remember in, in class, uh, the way in which this moment of the Annunciation uh, crystallized the um, cooperation of God's grace and human freedom. God's grace and human freedom coming together, which is very um, a characteristic of uh, Catholic sensibility. And, uh, and of course, you can see the, uh, the depiction of God the Father, and the Holy Spirit as a dove, uh, all coming together. This is the grace of God invading the world and Mary cooperating freely in receiving that grace. And it seems that this is not just a scene of the Annunciation, but also no. her acceptance because already the Spirit is coming upon her as promised. Yes. So there is a, there is a scene here of Mary's acceptance. Her this is really more a fiat than an annunciation. Yeah. Yeah, that let it be done to me according to your word. It's striking to look at uh, the depiction of God the Father. Uh, it reminds me of the depiction of God the Father we see in the Sistine Chapel. Yes. Um, yes, it does, doesn't it, with the, yeah. the finger. And, and that's one of the reasons, because the school of Ghirlandaio is a place where Michelangelo apprenticed. And right. So there's some sense that maybe that's a clue that he gave his touch to this painting. And I think, too, uh, especially the full faces that you see are, are really a part of the artistic uh, method in that period uh, of the 13th century. Uh, you begin to see uh, the embodiment of, of people rather than something being stark or whatever. Yes. Here, here the, the magnificence of the Renaissance uh, emphasis on, on human nature and the humanity. And humanity. Yeah. Yes, the humanity. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a great context, too, of it, her inwardness, of course, and her fiat. Uh, but there's an intensity about it that is just remarkable, that almost, uh, I think, invites people to, to go in. Uh, well, thank you very much. Okay. This has been, uh, thank you. It's a, this is a part of the patrimony of the Archdiocese of Chicago, and uh, surely a, a, a wonderful piece of art that I think will continue to inspire people for many years. And it's beautifully framed, isn't it? Yes. Well, just recently restored. Thank Great. you. Thank you. I'd like to share some reflections with you about this beautiful painting uh, that you have been able to, to see. Uh, Cardinal Supic and I spoke a bit about it. I want to expand on those comments in our dialogue. Uh, first of all, the scene of the Annunciation, of course, is taken from the first chapter of Luke's gospel. The story is well known. Uh, the angel of the Lord Gabriel is sent uh, to a young girl, poor girl, in a very small town, a backwater town of Nazareth. Uh, all the circumstances in a certain sense are kind of improbable, but what we're witnessing here is a decisive turn in the history of humanity. God is going to enter in to our human history and experience uh, our lives from within. So it, it is an extraordinary moment. And the painting captures a, a certain kind of intensity. Uh, you can see Mary's eyes are cast down. She's in a meditative uh, state. The angel is there. Uh, up in the corner is... Uh, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, uh, signified by the dove. Um, in any case, th this painting that depicts an intense religious experience uh, would seem to suggest that what's happening here uh, is deeply personal, uh, perhaps unique to Mary. And in a certain sense, that's true. It is a deeply 
personal experience. But at the same time, uh, as she receives this invitation to be the mother of the Lord, the mother of the Messiah, the one who would come among us, and through his life, death, and resurrection, redeem us, heal us, transform us. She's invited to be that instrument whereby he would come into the world. She's not only experiencing something on a deep personal level, uh, but she is there speaking uh, for all of humanity, all of humanity. She's saying yes to God, not only in her own name, but in the name of all human beings who are in need of healing, forgiveness, redemption, and new life. Now, I'm very much touched and moved by the words of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who wrote these words, which I will share with you, about 400 years before this painting. He speaks directly to the Virgin Mary, and he speaks with urgency, uh, calling her to say yes. Uh, it's a very powerful moment, but it helps us, uh, through Bernard's words, we are helped to understand uh, the immensity, the importance and the significance of her role in the whole unfolding of our salvation. So let me uh, share these words with you from St. Bernard as he addresses Mary directly in this scene that is depicted in the painting. You have heard, O Virgin, that you will conceive and bear a son. You have heard that it will not be by man, but by the Holy Spirit. The angel awaits an answer. It is time for him to return to God who sent him. We too are waiting, O oh lady, for your word of compassion. The sentence of condemnation weighs heavily upon us. The price of our salvation is offered to you. We shall be set free at once if you consent. In the eternal word of God, we all came to be, and behold, we die. In your brief response, we are to be remade in order to be recalled to life. Tearful Adam with his sorrowing family begs us of begs this of you, O loving virgin. In their exile from paradise, Abraham begs it, David begs it, all the other holy patriarchs, your ancestors, ask this of you as they dwell in the country of the shadow of death. This is what the whole earth waits for, prostrate at your feet. It is right in doing so, for on your word depends comfort for the wretched, ransom for the captive, freedom for the condemned, indeed salvation for all the sons of Adam, the whole of your race. Answer quickly, O virgin. Reply in haste to the angel, or rather through the angel to the Lord. Answer with a word. Receive the word of God. Speak your own word. Conceive the divine word. Breathe the passing word. Embrace the eternal word. Why do you delay? Why are you afraid? Believe. Open your heart to faith, O blessed Virgin, your lips to praise your womb to your creator. See, the desire of the nations is at your door knocking to enter. Arise in faith. Hasten, open open in praise and thanksgiving. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, she says, be it done to me according to your word. And so St. Bernard concludes this plea to the Blessed Virgin Mary with a repetition of her words, let it be done to me according to your word, the great fiat, 
let it be done. And she does say yes. And in that yes, and through that yes, she opens a way for the coming of the Savior among us. Now, there's one other element here, a dimension that is also really very important. The incarnation, the coming of the word of God among us, taking up our human condition, being just like us in all things but sin. This is a gift, a grace, something that we didn't deserve, earn, or merit. It is sheer grace. And at the same time, it is God's gift. It is also something that God wants us to receive, something that Mary needs to collaborate with, cooperate with. So God's grace always comes together with our free human response. And that pattern is fixed and set in a particularly powerful way in this scene of the Annunciation. There is a kind of divine human partnership. And it's through that that our healing, our redemption, our salvation takes place. So as we step back from this scene and this painting, there's something here that's very familiar, a familiar story, a familiar depiction. And yet if we stay with it, probe it, reflect on it, we, we come to understand the greatness of this moment and with a certain wonder we are and gratitude we can look on mary who in our name says yes and in our name cooperates with the lord that he might come among us and be with us thank you cardinal supage father camelli and the conservation center our third piece will be a retrospective. We will revisit key moments from our first four programs. There is a benefit to seeing them together as a whole. It shows the artistic genius and diversity of the paintings and sculptures, as well as the creative spiritual and theological visions that these artistic pieces embody. Seeing the whole brings home the art and faith of the individual pieces. Here is where we have been. My first thoughts, as I always come together with the uh, patrons of the arts uh, for the Vatican Museum, is one of gratitude. I'm so grateful for everything that you do. And what you do is not something just to contribute to the faith life of the church, but for the good of all society. Pope uh, St. Pope uh, pa Paul VI uh, once said something that was, I think, very apt for this moment. He says, the split between the gospel and the culture is without a doubt the drum of our time. What he was saying is that so often in life, our culture and the gospel being separated needs a way in which they're bound together again. And the patrons help in that wonderful enterprise of making sure that we bridge that gap. What I wanted to show you is actually the living history of these 
Byzantine Eastern Orthodox icons um, as we can see them in Chicago today. I mean, and so what you're looking at are icon paintings that are embedded in an architectural format. Um, and what you're seeing are that the central lower portion, the doors are closed, right? You can see that. You can't see through what is happening in the central space beyond this iconostasis. As long as we have Mary, Jesus will never be an abstraction. two paintings that we're going to consider this evening help us to draw our attention to the one, Mary, who links for so many of us heaven and earth. And it goes by the name Immaculate Conception, which means that in Mary, there is no disconnect between who she is and the divine source that floods her being. And there is no disconnect between who she is and other people in the world. So she is this epitome of loving God and loving neighbor. It is oftentimes, the Immaculate Conception is oftentimes associated with Mary's Magnificat, where she voices these words, my soul magnifies the Lord. So she is bringing forth the Lord in a magnification way. My spirit rejoices and God my Savior, for he has looked with favor upon the lowliness of his handmaid, and holy is his name. And then she goes on to talk about all that God has done for God's people and what God is doing. And in doing so, and when we sing this song together, we invite ourselves into the reality of Mary, and she invites us in, and we begin to experience what she is about. Virgin Mary in the back wearing blue um, makes a gesture of blessing with her hand extended and the palm turned downward, similar to the posture of one of her hands in, um, in the painting by Van Gogh. Interestingly, Caravaggio is one of the few artists to depict Mary at an appropriate age, rather than featuring her as timelessly youthful as Michelangelo had done and as we see perhaps in Van Gogh's painting as well. Artists were challenged by how to depict this mystical event. In the painting that we had seen previously, seen here, um, Christ reaches the Virgin Mary in the form of a dove sent by God the Father. Other artists were more literal in their depictions of the incarnation of Christ, um, showing the Virgin being sent to the Virgin Mary as a small Christ child and this famous painting in the cloisters in New York where you see the Annunciation taking place in a 15th century home in Bruges um, or as if it were in a 15th century home in Bruges and now I'll, I'm showing you a detail of that where you can see that the artist has depicted the um, incarnation of Christ as a small Christ child flying through the air carrying a cross alluding to his eventual death even before the fact of his birth, um, as we see here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and his son, the son gave his life for us as a sign of love, just like that mother presented her child. So Mary presents us with this memory, a memory that is not simply a recounting, but a living memory that instills in us the pride and the grief and the joy and the sorrow of our own deaths and the deaths that we are given, the deaths of others whom we love 
but the assurance of our Christian faith that the communion of saints is alive as we present ourselves in the thin veil of this life where the living and the dead come together. Guadalupe is another Marian image famous worldwide. Uh, a title of the Blessed Vir Virgin Mary associated with a series of Marian apparitions in Mexico in December of 1531. Um, and an image of uh, a venerated image on the cloak that enshrined, is enshrined within the Basilica of Guadalupe outside of Mexican, Mexico City today. Um, it is the most visited Catholic shrine in the world. Um, over the course of her feast days of December 11th and 12th, um, 6.1 million pilgrims on average per year visit her shrine. She's considered the patroness of Mexico and the continental Americas. She's also venerated by Native Americans on the account of the devotion calling for the conversion of all of the Americas. Replicas of the miraculous image uh, that's on your screen can be found in thousands of churches around the world where processions also occur, including here in Illinois and an annual feast day procession from Chicago to Des Plaines that draws a crowd second only to Mexico City across the world. It's organized by a family original from, originally from Michoacan, Mexico, with a special devotion to the Virgin of Guadalupe, and it draws hundreds of thousands of people every year. Art is spirit made visible through which the spirit of the time manifests outward and as a medium through which there is a dialogue with the soul. It's almost as if the spiritual and the psychological share the same DNA, like a double helix. Stories like this about the intercession of a black Madonna are told and retold all over Europe. Material representations of the black Madonna stimulate a recognition and resonance with the living healing archetype. Darkness, which can imply energy and mystery, can be transformative, a place to work throughout and problem solve. The journey to pray to the Black Madonna is not only about traveling to a particular place, but also about a journey to the depths within, a pilgrimage to the shrine of our own inner darkness. Through this journey, we are able to gain insight and self-awareness. In the Marian artistic and devotional tradition, Surely, an energizing origin story is the Annunciation in Luke. In fact, as Rebecca mentioned, legend has it St. Luke painted the Salus Populi Romani icon under the instruction of the Virgin Mary. Not bad credentials. But the Annunciation story is about Mary finally succumbing to and cooperating with divine love. It begins with the angel Gabriel telling Mary she is full of grace and the Lord is with her. In other words, she is the beloved of God. But she is not immediately delighted with this information. In fact, the story tells us she is troubled by this greeting and has to consider in her mind what it might mean. But the angel is persuasive. Uh, he tells her about past revelations responds to her hesitations, and eventually Mary comes to a place where she can receive divine love and cooperate with it. Her final line is, let it be done to me according to your will. We pray to Mary to guide us through the transition of dying into new life. She is our companion to hope beyond history. All this happens and so much more when art and faith come together. This initiative has been wonderful. Rosa Mystica, A Journey of Renewal and Restoration. This initiative was generously funded by the ACTA Foundation, the Shoal Foundation, the Shaw Family Supporting Foundation, 
the Stella Maris Fund, the Maza Foundation, the Richard H. Driehaus Charitable Lee Trust, and individual supporters. We are particularly grateful to Cardinal Supage for his continual support and his presentations in our first and final program. Finally, Father Jeff Wall, the Cardinal's representative to the patrons, will tell us the importance of the patrons and invite our support. It's my honor to invite you to join us in protecting the priceless cultural wonders of these most important Vatican museums so that they may continue to inspire people from around the world for generations to come. Your membership will support ongoing restoration work and critical conservation projects, along with capital improvements and the critical equipment needed for the restoration laboratories. Your support will also allow for the acquisition of valuable artwork and hiring and development of highly specialized restorers. In addition to these deep satisfaction that comes from your participation in these conservation and restoration projects, other significant benefits of membership include complimentary entrance and tour of the Vatican Museums, the ability to view some areas of the museum close to the public, and the opportunity to tour the restoration laboratories. You will also receive a subscription to the Patron of the Arts newsletter from the International Director and invitations to Illinois chapter members only events and fundraising events. So I enthusiastically invite you to become a patron. Membership dues uh, are $250 for clergy members, $250 for associate members under 35, $600 for an individual membership, and $1,200 for a family membership that includes two adults and children under 18. So contact us. You can reach us at the, our website, vaticanpatronschicago.org slash membership, or call us at 312-534-5351. Or you can email us at illinoispatrons at gmail.com. Thank you so very, very much for your interest and your support. There are so many people to thank. Our speakers, our content experts committee, and the Illinois Patrons Board. And we are thankful to you, our viewers. In addition to our Illinois viewers, we've seen patrons from Ohio, Pennsylvania, California, Florida, Washington State, New York, Brazil, Australia, and Italy, all who have participated in this series. For more information about the patrons and our future programs and events, and our Rome 2022 trip, just visit our website, I hope to see you real time very soon. Again, I'm ever grateful to all of you. Have a good evening. <music>